usually I have uh, books for sale, but the publisher <clears throat> didn't get them here on time, so uh, I have two chart books especially. Um, one we did, Tim LaHaye and I did a number of years ago that covers prophecy. A lot of the graphics that I use are from uh, the chart books. And another one that I did about five years ago with Ed Heinsohn, who recently went to be with the Lord, which covers from Genesis to Revelation the 6,020-something years of earth history, of history, and uh, covers the entire Bible in that chart book. And sorry, uh, they didn't send them out right away, so they didn't get here in time. But they're supposed to arrive Monday, and if you're interested in getting them, you can see Janice, my wife, at the table back there, and the secretary will, if you purchase them, will give them to you when they come. You, you'll be able to see her, and she will call you and let you know when they arrive. So, are you ready to rebuild? Well, Israel, and many of the people in Israel are ready to rebuild the temple. We had a book that came out just 30 years ago, called Ready to Rebuild, and John Walford wrote the foreword to it, and I did a smaller book version of that called The Last Day's Temple. These are both out of print now. <laughs> like you can get them on Amazon, though, if you're interested. Um, but I'd recommend uh, Randy Price did a real thick, like 1,200-page book on the temple. He did his Ph.D. dissertation at the University of Texas on that, so he has really studied it and thorough, thoroughly. But the Lord said, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem in Zechariah 8.3. He's going to return and dwell in Zion. Zion's a term that's used like 113 times or so in the Bible. It, it has kind of an optimistic connotation to it in relation to looking forward to the time when Israel is in their land being blessed by the Lord. And uh, it often has that, not always, but often has a forward-looking thing. And that's why uh, when they started the Zionist movement in 1897, they picked that term Zionism to refer to the efforts to reestablish the nation of Israel, which as you know, came to a full uh, fruition in 1948 after some bumps and along the way. Well, the, thir most 35, the most volatile 35 acres on planet Earth is clearly the Temple Mount. I know some of y'all have been there, I'm sure, walked on it. Uh, I think I mentioned my wife and I went to Israel on our honeymoon uh, 50 years ago almost, this January. And uh, back then, hardly anybody was up on the Temple Mount. And I remember going and spending like an hour or two just sitting in the Temple Mount area inside the Dome of the Rock and looking down and seeing the tip of Mount Calvary, uh, which is the Dome of the Rock has right in the middle. That's why it's called the Dome of the Rock or Al-Aqsa Mosque by the Muslims. And you see in this picture on the left bottom is uh, the Arab meeting place that is considered more holy than the Dome of the Rock area, according to the Arabs. So when we look at temples past, we see that the one that's going to be built in the near future is the third temple, but let's look at them. The Garden of Eden was first to be said to be a sanctuary. A sanctuary is where God meets people. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, remember? And the angel turning every which way prevented anybody in the pre-flood world from going back there. Because that's where the, we know God is omniscient. He's everywhere. But his special presence was there. It even says that he used to appear probably as a man, pre-incarnate Christ, and fellowship with Adam in the evening before the fall. And so they're kicked out. The angel was put to prevent anybody from going in. We have the sacrifices that were established 
in the interim, even before Abraham was called. And so Israel is going to have four temples in their history. Uh, you start with the tabernacle that was then built by uh, Solomon, the, the temple, Solomonic temple, and it was dedicated in four, 1446. Now that's the Exodus. And then you had the first temple, that was the tabernacle. I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm used to having the four temples slide up there. But these are some of the graphics, by the way, from our chart books that you, you would see in it. And in the first temple, uh, was built in 960 B.C., and it existed for 374 years. It was upgraded by uh, King Herod during the time of Christ. Well, I'm sorry, I, I'm getting all confused here, but you have uh, the temple was destroyed in 586 B.C., and it didn't exist for 70 years, and you can read about them going back and rebuilding the temple and it wasn't as nice as the first one, but by the time you get to the time of Christ, uh, it had been upgraded by Herod, and uh, they finished upgrading it about seven or eight years before it was destroyed again. And uh, Jesus appeared in the temple. The Shekinah glory departed the first temple. It was there in the first temple. In fact, it talks about in the scriptures about how... Uh, the Shekinah glory left the temple, went down the Kedron Valley for the first temple, and then ascended from the Mount of Olives, a pattern that Christ later executed himself when he left the Temple Mount area, went down the Kedron Valley, and eventually ascended from the Mount of Olives. And uh, so in the, its place in the uh, 6th century BC, AD, you have the... Um, uh, Muslims taking over Israel and they built the Dome of the Rock. Actually, it was first a wooden building and it was meant by Omar, who was the conquering Muslim, to commemorate the temple. They wanted to preserve the site of the Jewish temple. He wanted to make, Omar wanted to make that the most holy place in Islam, but he lost out. And Mecca and Medina, and then they... A building there on the on the Temple Mount, and actually the Jewish Temple is only considered the fourth most holy site in Islam. And of course, they later built the permanent thing that you see called the Dome of the Rock uh, about a hundred years later, and it has occupied and preserved the actual site of the temple where it had been. There's a lot of theories that could have been here or there, but there's no real merit to those. And so apparently this is going to be part of the agreement uh, to rebuild the temple when the Antichrist comes to power because it has to be there by the midpoint of the tribulation in order to be defiled. And then, of course, after the second coming, it's going to be destroyed by Christ's second coming, and he's going to bring from heaven with him the fourth temple, which is the millennial temple, which is one mile square it could not even fit upon the current 35 acres of the, where the Dome of the Rock is located, that Temple Mount platform, because it's much larger than that. So temples, tabernacle temple is where God meets man, and that's the idea of it, a, a, kind of a, a location. So you had the tabernacle. In fact, they, anybody ever been to that one they have in the southern part of Israel that's a replica of it? Yes, I have a German friend whose father built that tabernacle, took it all around Germany, and then uh, donated it there so you can go in and see what uh, 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 the actual tabernacle somewhat looked like. And there's the Ark of the Covenant, where it's believed that the Shekinah glory was present, God's presence was there in the Ark of the Covenant. Raiders of the Lost Ark and all of that, that's ridiculous because... God's presence left the, the Ark of the Covenant many, many years before uh, World War II. And uh, so there's Israel's first temple. In 1 Kings 5, 5 through 6, it says, Behold, I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to David my father, saying, 
your son whom I set uh, on your throne in your place, he will build the house for my name. Now therefore command that they cut for me cinders, uh, cedars from Lebanon and my servants will be with your servants and I will give you wages for your servants according to all that you say for you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the uh, Sidonians. So they built the first temple back in those days and uh, it was a place, you had the holy place, which is pictured here, and then you go into the holy of holies once a year and offer things. And it was destroyed in 586 BC and uh, a 70 year period between the start of the building of the second temple that you have in 516 BC and it was built and uh, upgraded by Herod as we've talked about uh, and destroyed in AD 70. And we see in Ezra 3 8 it says now in the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month Zerubbabel the son of Shittiel uh, and Je uh, Jesha the son of uh, Jazadek, Dek is the Hebrew word for holy, I know that, and the rest of their brothers, the priests and the Levites, and all who came from the captivity of, to Jerusalem began the work and appointed the Levites from tw uh, 20 years and older to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. So the Levites didn't just serve in the temple, apparently they built the <laughs> second temple as well, they're involved in that. Now, with the temple being destroyed, the body of Christ is said to be a temple uh, that Christ indwells. That's part of the rationale of the dwelling of the Holy Spirit that began in Acts 1 uh, with the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And so we're viewed as a spiritual temple, both corporately, the church as a whole, is said to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, as well as the individual. Different passages say both things that it, we individually are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and the church corporately is said to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit as well. And so it's a spiritual indwelling and therefore the temple in Jerusalem is not around uh, during this time. And the rapture of the church makes sense because it removes the spiritual temple so that God can return and deal with Israel. We see in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fit together is growing into a holy temple to, in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. That's that corporate indwelling idea. And every time a, a new believer comes in, it's like adding a new stone or piece to the temple because the foundation and the, the cornerstone is Christ. And the foundation, which lines up with Christ, is the apostles and prophets. And then successive believers coming in through the almost 2,000 years of church history complete the spiritual temple called the church. So the temple in prophecy. So as we look forward to what is called the third temple, now some people say, uh, see the first temple had two phases to it. So some people say, I thought there were three temples before that. No, first temple had two phases, but it's considered in Judaism to be all part of the first temple. And the second temple was the one built after the Babylonian captivity and it was destroyed upgraded and then destroyed uh, in AD 70. And then you have the third temple that's, as I say, going to be built and all we know is it's got to be there by the midpoint of the tribulation. We don't know if they're going to build it before the Antichrist comes on the scene at the beginning of the tribulation, before the tribulation begins. Uh, maybe it's halfway through this first half of the tribulation that's going to be completed. Uh, but I've talked, I've been to the Temple Institute a number of times in Israel and we've talked in fact, I had Gerson Solomon, who's head of the Temple of Mount Faithful, in my home, uh, and he spoke at a church I was pastor of uh, one time down in Austin, and uh, <clears throat> they believe that they could build the temple in seven months. 
and they have the Sanhedrin that's met. They're going to have electricity, allow electricity. They have to make all these decisions, you know, to adopt to modern, updated standards, and they've done all of that. And so they say they could build it in seven months, and it's, it'll be there by the midpoint of the tribulation. We see in Daniel 9, 26, 27, I read that last session, so I'm not going to read it again. Uh, the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, etc., and that will be. Uh, talks about that particular temple. The 70 weeks of Daniel we've talked about and how the 70th week is a future tribulation and we've seen that. And so the Antichrist is going to make an agreement with the nation of Israel. And once again, I don't think that means the Jews necessarily are going to worship the Antichrist. They're going to have an agreement just like if we had an agreement between Arab nations and Israel today, that doesn't mean they're going to worship or adopt the same God or anything. They're just going to have an agreement. And so Jesus in Matthew 24, 15 says, Therefore, on the, uh, when he was giving the uh, Olivet Discourse, he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. In other words, go back and learn what Daniel says. Uh, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So that's a sign at the midpoint of the tribulation for the Jews to get out of Dodge, as we would say. Leave. And they go to Petra, as I've already explained. And uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, let no one in any way deceive you for it. The day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy or the departure comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. One of the passages that indicates there'll be a temple there, and the Antichrist, of course, and Satan himself is going to want to take over, take God's place by doing that. And so we see in Revelation 11, verse 1, it says, And there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and uh, this is an angel here, or John, that was given that. And someone said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. So here's the fourth passage that talks, that envisions in the future a temple having been rebuilt. And it says, so there you have it. And leave out the court, which is outside the temple, so you can see here the temple, that my cursor's not working, okay. You can see the temple there on the left side, uh, and then you have the temple mount area that, on, on surrounding the temple there. And the court of the women was simply a place that women could go, men as well. And, and uh, then you, it says, leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it it has been given to the nations or the Gentiles and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. It's referring to the second half of the tribulation. And so the temple will have been rebuilt. It will have been the abomination of desolation and it will be under the control of Gentiles, in this case the Antichrist, for the last 42 months before the second coming. And uh, th there it is. And so you have animations of what the future temple is going to look like here in Ju on various Jewish sites. And it, sa it talks about the two witnesses in chapter 11. It says, and when they have finished their testimony, they're going to be there during the first half, I believe, uh, clearly the first half, and they're going to be preaching the gospel to the nation of Israel. And when they have finished their testimony... The beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Now, why, why do, are they allowed there for three and a half years? Well, or for a long time before the midpoint of the tribulation. Because if anybody messes with them, what does Scripture say? They, they call down fire from heaven and can destroy anybody that messes with them. So apparently when their time comes to go, God allows them to be killed by the Antichrist. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, 
which mystically is called Sodom in Egypt. That's referring to Jerusalem in this context here. Uh, where also their Lord was crucified because of these events that took place. That's why it's identifying it with Sodom and Egypt. In other words, it was evil that brought that apart. But that's Jerusalem, where their Lord was also crucified. <clears throat> and then it says, and those from the peoples, in other words, the nations, and tribes, and tongues, and nations, uh, and that's that term that's used like six or seven times in the book of Revelation, to describe everybody other than Israel, uh, will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. Now, if you know anything about Israel, when somebody dies, what do they do? They bury them within 24 hours. They have their, you know, that's why you never know when you go to work, if you're an Orthodox person or something, you, know, you may end up doing a funeral that day because somebody might die and everybody goes to their funeral. Okay, but they're going to allow their body to lie in the street for three and a half days. That is a huge insult. By the way, the Muslims are the same way about that. And, it's, it, and that is a huge insult for them to allow that to occur. And then it says, and those who dwell upon the earth, that's that term for an unbeliever, used throughout the book of Revelation for, uh, for unbelievers, those who dwell upon the earth, their focus is on the earth, not on heaven as opposed to heaven dwellers, will rejoice over them and make merry, and they will send gifts to one another because the two prophets tormented those who dwell upon the earth. Uh, why do they torment the unbelievers? You know, with the message... <laughs> of the gospel, just like some people even today are feel tormented when you preach the gospel to them. And they're going to be so happy that they are killed, like it appears we're gaining momentum, we're winning, you know, we're getting rid of these guys, and boy, are they disappointed. And after the three and a half days, kind of a recapitulation of Christ's death and resurrection here, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet and gave, and great fear fell upon those who were beholding them. I mean, they're passing out presents and celebrating and doing all of this, and all of a sudden, they're resurrected. And this is another testimony that they are servants of the Lord. They're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, who was resurrected as well. And some real drama going on here. <laughs> and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. So God, like he spoke, you know, when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He doesn't need amplifiers or anything. He speaks from heaven. Come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud and their enemies beheld them. So this is a testimony to the unbelievers uh, at this point in history. So, and in that hour, there's a great earthquake, so this is what accompanies it, and a tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The rest, I assume, would be believers, you see. And uh, so God does a supernatural thing right there showing that those are his witnesses and it, it is set in opposition to what the Antichrist is trying to achieve at that point uh, in the tribulation period. So the rest were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven, as we've said there. Because why? God is showing them strong on behalf of believers at this point. <clears throat> now, it says in verse chapter 13, verse 14, and he deceives those, talking about the, the beast, who dwell on the earth. There's that term, the earth dwellers. In, in the original language, that's a single participle with an article. The earth, those who dwell upon the earth is a normal translation as a noun there. It's a, uh, and I like to call them the earth dwellers. 
because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast. You know, so uh, Satan apparently uh, brings about some signs that deceive the unbelievers, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. See, so that, that is Satan's counterfeit resurrection, if you will. But as I say, I think God does it because only God can bring people to life. He does it to, as part of the deception to draw out the focus on the unbelievers at this point, you see. And so that's what happens at the midpoint there in the temple. So that's Israel's third temple uh, that is going to be an interesting time. And that's why some call it the Antichrist temple because the Antichrist is the one that goes into that temple and uh, those events take place. So we see in Revelation 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. See, I, I don't think the Old Testament ever talks about uh, the eternal state. And here at chapters Revelation 21 and 22 are the only places, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, that talk about the new heavens and the new earth. In other words, after the thousand-year millennium, into the new heavens and new earth where we're going to dwell for all eternity as believers. So I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Now, some people think it's simply a redo of the present heaven and earth. I don't. Because the word, if it were talking about a redo, it would use the Greek word neo. Instead, it uses the Greek word kainos, which means brand new. And uh, I don't want to get off on that. But nevertheless, I think it's a brand new creation. And it's going to be, we think this, you know, you can go to places in the, in the world today. And even this fallen creation is very beautiful at various points. Just think how amazing. God's going to put his absolute best into this brand new creation that he's going to do. And there was no longer any sea. See, sea in the Bible represents the potentiality of evil, corporate evil. Because you have in the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, the sea represents the Gentile masses of humanity that are stirred up by the wind, the trends and things like this. You see it when Satan is released from the prison and the, the, the masses join with him as he, he inspires them in some way. And so the sea represents something that's in, unstable, that can be whipped up by the winds, et cetera, and become very dangerous. There's water in the new creation coming down from the throne of God, a very uh, profitable spring that produces stuff on each side, but no sea, meaning there's no potentiality of the future creation falling back into sin. Once that's accomplished, it's not gonna, it's gonna be locked in to believers and unbelievers, unbelievers in the lake of fire, believers in the new creation. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. We're all going to live forever in a New Jerusalem. Isn't that great? God's city, met, uh, ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, at least theoretically, a woman's supposed to look her most, her prettiest, most beautiful on her wedding day. I know many women spend days getting ready for that wedding, <laughs> getting all fixed up and all of that. So this, this is the idea here. This is going to be the absolute best that God's going to give us in the new creation. Isn't that amazing? And um, as a bride made ready, adorned for her husband. And so it goes on and says in verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. In other words, he's going to come and dwell with us. We're going to hang out with God. And he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. You know, his purpose for Israel was Israel to be his people. Now all believers in eternity are going to be his people. And he himself, God the Father even, is going to be present and during history, all we see, not that that's bad in any way, 
is the second person of the Trinity. I believe that was the pre-incarnate Christ who talked to Adam in the, before the fall in the garden, et cetera, all throughout history, those appearances. But now even God the Father, who is sheer deity, is going to be available for fellowship with us during this time. The Holy Spirit, of course, will be there as well. Um, and we see where it says in verses 22 and 23, and I saw no temple in it, for the Lord, the God Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. See, what did we say? A temple was where God met man. It was a, kind of like a clean room would be today. It has to be purified of any impurity that's not holy. And so the, the, the holy place and then the, the holy of holies, you had to jump through all these ritual hoops for, the, for one priest to go into the Holy of Holies to meet him one time, and they tied a rope around his leg in case he wasn't accepted by the Lord so they could drag him out because who would want to go in and get him, you know, <laughs> if for some reason he uh, was rejected by the Lord. But now there's no need for a temple because everything is holy. Everything, there's no sin. Sin has been totally removed, no contaminants. And the whole new creation is going to be that way. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is illuminated. I bet that's brighter than the sun. I remember when I was a boy, I, I was going to stare at the sun one day. What an idiot, you know. <laughs> Didn't last very long. <clears throat> and I used to have a magnifying glass and burn ants. You ever done that? That was fun. <laughs> Well, back in the day. For the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. See, this is the glory of God shining from the Lamb, the second person of the Trinity. Isn't this amazing? I mean, I have not seen nor ears heard nor is near the heart of man the things that God has restored for those of us that know him, you know? And, this is, and he's telling us some of this right now. And... Uh, and one of the implications is why waste a few moments in this life involved in sin when you got this future for all eternity? See, it's supposed to be a motivation for us in the nasty now and now. And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. Just So here's the idea that... Uh, in the ancient world that you have of bringing the wealth into the capital city area, you see? And so all the wealth, apparently there's going to be that kind of stuff going on as well in the new heavens and new earth, is going to be brought to him because he's the source of all wealth. He's the one worthy of that. And it says, and in the daytime, for there shall be no night, there its gates shall never be closed. And so God Created, separated the light from darkness there in Genesis 1-3, I believe, or is it 1-4, I forget. And uh, that showed that the original creation had the potentiality for evil because you had the sea and you had the night. And humanity was untested. They weren't, they weren't fallen, but they weren't tested yet. This is going to be a humanity that's been tested and redeemed and not able to fall into sin again. So there's none of those bad symbol, symbolic things like the sea or the night that are going to be in that new creation. It's just going to be light. And we're dependent creatures, don't we? We have to eat. We have to sleep. Apparently we're not going to have to sleep, probably not going to have to eat, but we can eat. Isn't that great? Kind of like Christ after the resurrection. Uh, its gates shall never be closed. What does that mean? It means there's no evil out there that could come in. You're going to leave the gates open the whole time. And it says, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So apparently there'll still be national entities here. And whatever that nation's good at, they're going to bring that to the central location there in the New Jerusalem. And the spirit, and so you, the book of Revelation ends, and it says the spirit and the bride say come. So 
as the book of Revelation tells you about this future, it gives us an invitation because there's still an opportunity to trust Christ in our day. And the, the Spirit and the Bride, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, none of you, none of us got saved apart from the Holy Spirit working inside. As you preach the gospel, the Holy Spirit moves or doesn't on the hearts of men, opening their fallen nature to the good news of Jesus Christ. And so still, the whole, so as this book closes, and we're not yet in that time, even though it's given us a glimpse, you have a final appeal. It says, the spirit and the bride invite you, say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And the Bible talks about hearing versus not hearing. So the one who hears is able to come and let the one who is thirsty Rivers of living water flowing, as Christ said in John 4. Who is thirsty, let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. It's free, God has provided. And so the book of Revelation closes with an invitation to people to come to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Just as we are to continue providing that invitation to the world and saying, on behalf of Jesus Christ himself, we're inviting you to trade in your sin and trust Christ as your Savior because he's paid for it. So, that's it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this tremendous future that we have in Jesus Christ and the fact that he, his death on the cross by our sin has made this tremendous future that we have. And no matter how bad our life is here on planet Earth, If we're a believer, it's only going to be better. But if someone who's an unbeliever, uh, this is the best it will ever be for them. For their destiny is the lake of fire. And so we invite people to come and drink of the living water so that they can trade in their sin for a Savior and a ticket for all eternity to the new heavens, new earth, to be with Christ. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit for all eternity and other believers as well. In Christ's name we pray, amen.